the inverse triangular spin structure and magnetic property of epitaxially grown uh, manganese 3 tin and manganese 3 gallium system. Thank you. Just, ah, I don't have USB. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I can just use the pointer. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So you can, you can consider my talk as a part of experimental part of the previous talk. <laughs> so uh, we, we can have, I mean, why we interested in this system is that it can have really uh, exotic transport property, not like the usual, non -co uh, usual collinear antiferromagnetic system. So only in, uh, if and only if the isotropic crystalline field environment you can always you know, represent this spin structure by using simple symmetry, time reversal, and translation, but half of it, half of the unit cell. And simple antiferromagnetic spin order can, uh, it, there's absent of the, any anomalous transport property. But on the other hand, if you have this kind of special symmetry, broken PT symmetry, manganese 3 iridium, for example, platinum, or manganese 3 gallium, or tin, or that matter, Non-collinear antiferromagnetic spin order can, you know, give you the really exciting property in terms of the transport, also the uh, really um, exotic band structure, uh, for example, Jira and or wild coins. So actually, the spin structure of this material has been uh, known for a while. I mean, they started this material only as early as 1970s by using neutron diffraction technique. So they realized that all these three material, if they have this special type of structure, which is uh, hexagonal structure, uh, which we call uh, epsilon phase. So if this system has uh, this kind of um, crystalline structure, you could have this inverse triangular spin structure, this one sublattice and the other. So it's not like the usual, you know, the triangular spin structure where you can reconstruct the spin configuration by rotating uh, two pi uh, in a clockwise direction, but this one is anti-clockwise rotated. So actually they got really good prediction about the um, spin structure uh, by just considering the symmetry of this material and magnetic uh, structure. So either we can have this structure or that. The two spin structures, spin configuration, are equivalent in terms of the uh, symmetry and also the energetically uh, degenerate state. And also, all this spin structure lies on this the basal plane, not pointing along this v-axis. So you can forget, uh, you, you can ignore about this magnetic space group for now. So actually, what you can do and what you can observe from this particular material, you can have anomalous hole effect or inertia effect and uh, magnetic spin hole effect and also perpendicularly polarized out of plane spin current as well. And also you can switch this antiferromagnetic order by applying a uh, spin current from the heavy metal underneath of the material or the, uh, above the material. And so we got interested in this material and also lots of uh, many works has been done, have been done uh, based on the bulk system, not the uh, thin film system. So in terms uh, from the perspective of application, uh, it will be really interesting if we can realize this system uh, in epitaxial way in, in thin film form to be able to um, perform lots of spin related transport uh, property measure, uh, experiment. So, but uh, yeah, these materials are really interesting materials, but from the experimental list point of view, it's really hard to realize it because as you can see from this phase diagram, this phase diagram is really messy, I would say. So we are aiming at this phase, particular phase, epsilon phase, it only has a, a stable uh, chemical composition range like one to two percent. So you have to be really precise uh, to be able to uh, obtain this particular um, structure. I mean, I'm talking about crystalline structure, not talking about the uh, magnetic structure yet, but it is kind of uh, prerequisite, uh, absolutely have to have uh, this 
crystalline structure to be able to observe non-collinear spin structure uh, on this, in this system. So we are aiming uh, to grow this particular two system, epsilon phase of manganese 3 keen and manganese 3 gallium, and we sweep the uh, competition range, uh, sorry, it should be gallium here. And, but the problem is that the lattice, cons I mean, we could use lots of, you know, many types of substrate, but we uh, wanted to use aluminum oxide uh, because uh, we can prepare the surface, good quality of the surface quite easily without treat treating it in, in some sort of an exotic you know, chemical agent or something like that. But the problem is that the lattice constant difference between this substrate and this main material are really huge, more than, more than 90%. So we have to have a, some sort of buffer layer to um, minimize this mismatch, uh, uh, lattice mismatch uh, between aluminum oxide substrate and the main layer of manganese 3 keen and gallium. So we use, just use a um, conventional sputtering technique. And uh, because we have to be really precise about the competition, we double and triple and quadruple check the chemical our comp uh, competition of our thin film by using XRF and ICP OSE and Rutherford backscattering and XPS. And crystallographic uh, properties, we use utilize XRD and XRR and TEM. And um, in t uh, for the magnetic property, uh, we use squid uh, magnetometer. And also in order to observe the magnetic structure, uh, we brought this sample to the neutron diffraction facility to observe the spin structure. So let's begin with the uh, ruthenium buffer layer. As I said, it, uh, it will give the you know, proper underground for manganese 13 and gallium to be able to uh, be grown on, actually on top of this surface, uh, this substrate. So we achieved really nice and, and smooth Recording surface stopped. of ruthenium. And uh, we realized that, uh, we checked that the orientation, relative orientation of ruthenium with respect to the certain axis of aluminum oxide, we found that ruthenium film is, was grown uh, 30 degree away uh, with respect to the A axis of the aluminum oxide. So we can say the abduction relationship like this. And it kind of, you know, uh, uh, make a good uh, lattice uh, environment for manganese 3 tin and gallium uh, to be grown on top of it because it minimizes the, I mean, it lowers the mismatch, lattice mismatch between um, aluminum oxide and the, uh, the manganese 3 gallium and tin uh, below 1%. So, at, so after that, after uh, optimizing the ruthenium buffer layer growth, we uh, try to deposit manganese 3 tin and gallium on top of it. As you can see from these two TM images, we uh, found that two systems were grown abstractly uh, with uh, while having, I mean, with having a uh, epsilon phase uh, that we aimed for. So this is uh, in plane, uh, this is out of plane XRDs. So it tells you that our manganese 3 tin system has actually grown on top of 0001 aluminum oxide substrate the, along the C direction. But when you look, in, look at uh, look this system from the uh, side, I mean the in-plane direction, the orientation relationship between substrate and the main layer is uh, 30 degree shifted so that we can have uh, so for example, x-axis of uh, manganese 3 tin or gallium along the y-axis of uh, aluminum oxide so that we can uh, find the proper and correct direction of uh, manganese 3 tin and gallium to be able to measure the anisotropy of uh, conductivity or, or, or the transfer property because the symmetry is really important uh, in this material. We have to uh, know the exact direction of the main uh, layer. So, but it doesn't assure that you have an inverse triangular spin structure in your system. Um, just because you have a epsilon phase of uh, 
uh, crystalline structure. So we brought this system to the sample to the uh, neutron diffraction facility, where, uh, which is in the UK. But uh, yeah, it's called ISIS. <laughs> So you can actually measure all the neutron diffraction patterns uh, surrounding, I mean, uh, covering almost 320 degree and also 30 degree out of plane direction. So you can map it out, the neutron diffraction pattern. By the way, this is just 60 nanometer or 30 nanometer thin film. It's extremely uh, hard to detect some uh, neutron diffraction. Yep. Do you stack several films together to make a large sample? No, we use just one by one substrate, one centimeter, one centimeter, and ruthenium buff layer and 30 nanometer or 60 nanometer of the main layer, and then cap it with ruthenium to prevent the oxidation, and we just measure it. Because uh, this facility here has really high flux of neutron beam, so you're able to uh, measure uh, really small signal with. Average for a long time, sorry. Do you have the average for a long time? To get Not that long. I mean, for example, one scan will take like two or three hours. I mean, you can take longer scan to uh, be more precise, but uh, this one we, we got. But it has been known that uh, this system could have, could show some phase transition, I mean, in terms of the magnetic structure from non-collinear spin structure to the helical structure. So after that, after you pass uh, that transition point, you will lose all the anomalous transport property because it doesn't hold uh, that symmetry anymore. But in our system, interestingly, we took 300, uh, we took neutron diffraction at different temperatures. So as you can see, <coughs> this 101, <coughs> excuse me, 101 diffraction uh, line doesn't show any splitting. So usually it indicates the, um, <coughs> magnetic structure um, transition from, I mean, for this particular material. If you have split it line alongside this one, uh, one zero one peak, uh, there, it is an indication that you have helical spin forward. But in our case, our, uh, this non-collinear spin structure uh, is, was stable, even down to like 50K or something like that. But in our case, in this particular system, we don't have uh, purely magnetic uh, uh, diffraction uh, peak. So we have structure plus magnetic peak. It goes down as you uh, heating up the sample above the or above or uh, above the new temperature. So in our case, you know, the bulk system could have Nail temperature as high as 420 Kelvin, but in our case, uh, after fitting the data, we assume that our nail temperature is slightly lower than, the, you know, slightly 60 Kelvin lower than bulk sample. But it's still high enough for us to be able to, you know, perform uh, ex uh, electrical measurement at room temperature. Uh, by the way, if you uh, refine this uh, neutron diffraction pattern, you will end up having these two uh, spin structure that I showed you in early in my talk. So energetically degenerate, so symmetrically as well. So you could have these two spin structures. Uh, basically, it depends on the magnetic field you apply, uh, the direct direction of the magnetic field you apply. So actually, the interest, one more interesting thing about this system that it could show weak ferromagnetic moment while the uh, spin structure, uh, the spin configuration is antiferromagnetic at the order. So here's why. Because this Kagome lattice in the plane, AB plane, basal plane, and Kagome plane break, breaks the, uh, um, yeah, loss of symmetry. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the detail. So because of that, you can have DMI interaction along uh, possibly Z direction with respect to the plane uh, of the base, uh, base of plane, possibly up or down. But um, uh, here's a theoretical, calc I mean, the prediction that if you have this kind of structure um, the, due to the in plane DMI uh, interaction or out of plane DMI interaction, you, you, you could have two different um, uh, spin structure. But in this case, in our, uh, this manganese-3 
something system has a positive, uh, positive uh, negative, or sometimes it depends on the, the definition of the sign. But in our case, the spin, spins are, are lying only on plane, plane, basal plane. There's no component, I mean, no component along the C direction. So, and plus, because these uh, two spins are canting slightly off uh, from their easy axis, so that this slight tilting and shift shift uh, from their easy axis uh, gives you the small mag net magnetic moment, even though this system is antiferromagnetic material. But the net magnetic moment is extremely small compared to uh, the usual ferromagnetic material, for example, palm alloy. So this system has, in the case of magnetic 13, it has yeah, approximately 1,000 times smaller magnetization compared to palm alloy. Yeah. And now we know that our magnetic structure is either this or this. We can do uh, the symmetric, uh, symmetric consideration uh, to extract some uh, feeling about what kind of transport property we, we could get. So I copied from this uh, magnetic group table and <clears throat> there's a symmetry operation <clears throat> that uh, if you use all these eight symmetry operation, you can just uh, uh, reconstruct this spin structure uh, for this and that. So by using this symmetry operation, you can also calculate uh, the, yeah, using this symmetry operations, uh, you can also calculate the non-zero symmetry imposed non-zero uh, conduct Non zero uh, conductivity tensor elements. I mean, I'm just showing the anti symmetric part. Or you could just, sorry, I'm just holding it. You could just use this uh, nice program here that the previous presenter wrote. But uh, yeah, there's more better way to do this. But after considering your spin structure and the symmetry operation, basically you will know. Uh, what kind of, I mean, the anomalous transport property uh, you will observe along certain direction. So for example, there are two different uh, symmetry uh, point, point group here. So one is M, 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 but after Y and Z axis is uh, the anti-symmetric, and X and Z axis is anti-symmetric. And in, that ca in this case, you can have anomalous whole conductivity along Y, uh, the, the transport transverse voltage along y-axis while you applying current along z-direction. In this case, uh, along x-direction while you're applying uh, z-direction at the current along the z-direction. So it is easy to think of having, uh, the measuring this uh, anomalous whole effect uh, using this geometry in the case of bulk. Uh, and, um, but I, I will get, get into it. So, but we found funny that not all the reports about thin film uh, magnetic 13 system reported uh, full magnetization property. They just showed uh, room temperature data or sometime um, just, I don't know what to say, a uh, little bit not clear magnetization and as well as somehow epitaxially grown film showed really high coercivity compared to this bulk material. Here, coercivity is below like 1,000 Erstat, but here, uh, no, not 1,000 Erstat, 100 Erstat, but here is more than 20 times larger than that. So there's something going on. So we try to uh, optimize our uh, film structure as well as the composition and growth parameters, and we end up having this magnetization property. 300, I, we took a magnetization data from three, at, 300, 200, and 100K, the values and as well as the coercivity kind of agree, uh, well agree with the bulk data. So in this case, you know, according to the report, so uh, saturation magnetization at room temperature is about seven millimole bore per functional unit. In our case, uh, we, we've got uh, seven or eight millimole bore per functional unit. 
And also the temperature dependent magnetization property showed really similar behavior as you could see from the bulk data here. So there is a upturn uh, around 200 K and, and there's a kind of saturation uh, below 100 Kelvin. So we think that we uh, achieved a system which shows really a similar property compared to the bulk system. And also we confirm the spin structure as well. But uh, as I said, some from some reports, we've, uh, the people reports uh, reported really high coercivity even though they grow this film in epitaxial way. So I think we have a, uh, the answer to that. So in this case, uh, I'm showing the, the phase diagram of manganese gallium. It's really complicated. Um, so let's compare uh, our system to the, uh, uh, the previously reported one. This is reported back in 2012. And they claim that they have epsilon phase of manganese 3 gallium uh, while they have a really enormous, enormous coercivity field, more than three tesla. And even though you apply five tesla, you, can, you can't you know, somehow saturate this system. So we observe this kind of behavior from our system as well, only from the sample where we, which we grow uh, uh, the system at, ah, sorry, this is opposite. So at low temperature, which means that it contains, uh, uh, contains lots of you know, additional phases, uh, not just having a epsilon phase of uh, manganese 3 tin. So as you can see from this XRD pattern, uh, this red curve uh, represents the, uh, the XRD pattern of the sample that show this, you know, uh, the black curve here, small coercivity and small magnetization. And on the other hand, uh, no, it's opposite. Sorry, uh, the high coercivity, uh, the sample that show high coercivity uh, show the peak, the main peak at about 41.37 uh, degree. And, uh, but the other sample which showed small coercivity uh, showed the peak at 41.47. It's really small, tiny difference between them, but we can uh, actually uh, assign a phase of main, uh, no, crystalline structure of this system as a hexagonal system still, but having a really large unit cell, which can give you really enormously large magnetization in the case of magnetic three gallium. So we wanted to uh, observe the anomalous hole effect and Nernst effect because we know that our magnetic structure is the same as the bulk system and magnetization showed really uh, promising uh, result. But here's a problem because we have to measure the either measure the vertical voltage drop or applying current perpendicularly uh, uh, with respect to the filling plane with, uh, in order to observe the transverse voltage because the conductivity tensor element says either YZ or X, uh, ZX or vice, uh, you, you can swap the, the axis. So here's the te technique we use. We drill a hole, really small one, right on top of our sample surface, like a radius of 100 or 150 nanometer. And we kind of implemented the, the probe from the top. And we use the bottom buffer layer as a, our bottom electrode after removing all the uh, manganese 3 gallium or tin layer. So here's the magnified image. So actually by probing the voltage difference between here and there, you can get the, the voltage drop across the, the direction perpendicular to the filling plane. So here's what we observe. So we apply the magnetic field along, so this is X axis of the manganese 3 tin, and apply the, uh, apply, uh, the electrical current along Y axis and then picking up the voltage along the Z axis. So it corresponds to low YZ. And uh, our sample also showed that the really small coercivity compared to, uh, com uh, compatible to the bulk system. And in order to, but the, here's the important 
uh, issue because in order to have anomalous whole conductivity, you have to know the uh, longitudinal uh, resistivity and also the transverse uh, resistivity. But in our case, transverse resistivity is perpendicular direction. So we have to find a way to measure the, the resistance uh, resistivity along the z direction. So we, we measured uh, the anisotropy in the, uh, the, the resistivity along x or y axis. So this is for ruthenium and this is for manganese 3 tin layer. We apply the uh, Fuchs uh, timer model to uh, extract the, 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 the resistivity values from uh, the measured data. And the important issue here is that we have to measure the perpendicular resistance uh, with, with the, uh, we're, we're, we're measuring it. Uh, we borrowed the idea from the CPP GMR measurement by uh, changing the radius of the pillar and then measuring the four point resistance and you can actually have a, a we hope that we're gonna have linear dependence uh, with respect to the size of the pillar and then you can extract the resistance, uh, the perpendicular resistance out of it. So after that, we will uh, calculate the anomalous whole conductivity and probably we will write a paper about it. And interesting is that we also observed longitudinal, negative longitudinal magnetic resistance. So which uh, is known for the, the kind of A evidence of existence of biopoint at the Fermi level. But I, I don't know. <laughs> So here's, you, you're seeing the uh, magnetal, longitudinal magnetal conductance and from the bulk sample, and here the magnetal, longitudinal magnetal resistance uh, in our, from our sample. So it showed negative uh, magnetic resistance while you're applying magnetic field and current along the same direction. So it's not common for any type of metal. And interestingly, we lost kind of, you know, start losing this signal, the magnitude of this signal as we approach to the, you know, uh, the phase transition temperature uh, below 50K from the inverse triangular structure to the uh, helical spin order. So actually we also measured the Nernst effect, uh, which showed uh, here. So also, we also tried to measure the uh, domain structure by applying thermal gradient from the top and measuring the as uh, scanning the surface. But the problem was the surface was too low up. So probably it, yeah, represents the, the individual grain switching rather than just uh, switching, switching of the grain uh, in the below of this uh, the roughy surface. So we optimize the surface roughness uh, quite significantly and we, we are uh, on to uh, we, we, we try to measure the, uh, the domain structure by using this well-optimized sample. So I use up the time. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.